Hello, hello. Welcome to the show. Another solo show for you today. Are you following me on Instagram? At Seth Says. If you are, you know that I have recently read Dr. Daniel Amen's book, Your Brain is Always Listening. Dr. Amen is a psychiatrist and New York Times bestselling author. He is the doctor that did the brain scans on the Kardashian show. He's done many interviews that you might have seen or heard, including one on the Skinny Confidential podcast. He's worked with Dr. Oz, Dr. Phil, a thousand other people. He is Miley Cyrus's doctor, Bella Hadid, Justin Bieber, Megan Trainer, and I'm sure a lot of other celebrities. I initially, I initially got this book based on the title. Your brain is always listening. Tame the hidden dragons that control your happiness, habits, and hang-ups. Catchy, right? I didn't even realize it was Dr. Amons. And if I had known this, I'm not sure I would have picked it up. The fact that he's worked with so many celebrities isn't exactly why I am unsure of him. But it's the fact that he's so out there about it that's made me a little eh. And... The, I think the first line of this book, he's talking about Miley Cyrus. So you know what I'm saying. Um, also, a simple Google search will tell you that not everyone in the mental health field is convinced of his approach. He has developed this SPECT brain scan approach. Um, I've read that at least part of the criticism is that he tends to treat the brain scan as the sole means of diagnosing and treating a wide range of mental health conditions when other doctors say that the scans are great, but they're not a whole picture. It's not enough to then provide a treatment plan. I am not a doctor. I, I can't confirm or deny any of this. I just know that there is talk and speculation. And just as a consumer of some of the interviews and things he's done, and if you've heard him give one, you know, his style is very curt. There is no sugarcoating or fluff. Um, one might describe it as condescending. Uh, I get some arrogant vibes. I do. I don't know. I mean, it, that doesn't change the fact that his work is interesting. And even if the brain scan isn't, you know, a, a way to decide someone's complete picture of mental health, who wouldn't want one? I mean, I want one. I, I want one. And I mean, obviously, he's gone to school. He's done things. That, so... Anyway, I just say this to say, I'm a little unsure of, of him and his work, but I do find it interesting. Now, I read 20 books last year and didn't feel compelled to do a follow-up solo show on any of them, but I got about 50 pages into this one and knew that I was going to do one. Why? Well, because much of this book is exactly why I started this podcast in the first place. The introduction makes a lot of promises. Now bear with me a second because throughout this show I'm going to be referencing exact lines for you. So I'm going to find the page. Um, as far as the introduction and making a lot of promises, for example, he says, this book will explore the many reasons, some hidden and some obvious, in parentheses like the pandemic, that dragons and ANTs are constantly talking to your brain, making you feel sad, anxious, worried, depressed, mad, or out of control. With practical strategies to tame your dragons, you will take control of your brain and be able to choose what it listens to. You'll no longer give in to negative thinking or let bad habits derail your health and relationships, even in times of trauma, extreme stress, or grief. You'll be able to recognize what's true Build your self-confidence, discipline your mind, and feel happier, calmer, and in more control of your own destiny. In order to get and stay well, once you understand and use this information, share it with loved ones. That way, you are also creating your own support group, making it more likely you will keep these new habits for the rest of your life. Okay, so basically the dragons are, are past. It's our past. The dragons are our past. Things from our past that cause us, like, emotional scars, damage. The, the experiences from our past that become the thoughts in our head. The ANTs are, you know, he, it's an acronym for something I can't remember at this exact moment, but it's, like, 
the ANTs are the specifics. So the dragons, which I'll talk about more in a second, are the overall experiences and the ANTs are the thoughts that develop from those experiences. And so basically what he's saying is, and he's showing, you know, scans, brain scans of, you know, healthy brains versus like traumatized brains. And, you know, he's making a lot of promises. You're never going to have negative thoughts. You're going to be able to control your brain. You're going to be able to do all these things. And, you know, that's, that's pretty big. Moving on, and I promise all this will come together, the first section of the book is called Tame the Dragons from Your Past, Your History is Not Your De Your Destiny. And yeah, my issue with this book and what I'm going to continue to talk about and my issue with many other well-intentioned people on the internet, books, and podcasts are that we have these big promises and then section one goes into the instructions on how to do it, right? But there isn't a lot of discussion on actually how to do the things that he wants you to do. <laughs> and there's hardly any talk of, hey, this isn't an overnight process, or hey, you might need professional help from a therapist to really do this work, or hey, you're going to have to read this book a few times in order to really get it. Now, that being said, I think he does an actually a great job of giving an introduction of the brain and how the brain works. Like all of that was very well done. I'm going to continue to take you through some of how this book is presented to continue piecing this all together. So for each dragon, he shares the origin, the triggers, the reactions, some movies that a person with this dragon might like, his personal stories around that particular dragon, and the tools to tame it. And yeah, it sounds great. And I'm not saying, again, it's entirely unhelpful, but it's presented in a way that's like, hey, here's a possible very deeply rooted emotional scar. And just do one, two, three, and four to tame that scar and cope with it. And as a person who can confidently say that I do not have severe trauma from my childhood, I can't imagine reading this book if I had. It's oversimplified, and if I had read this book a year or two ago before doing some of my own deep work with my therapist and from reading a library full of books, I think I'd be pretty disappointed in this approach. Um, I can read it now and apply the much-needed context from other resources and know that I can take what I'm reading and bring it to my therapist to actually get into the discussion. Okay, let me give some more context. So there are 13 potential dragons from the past, which, you know, like I said, he's essentially saying are the influences of our past that have great emotional impact on us today. You can take a quiz at knowyourdragons.com to figure out yours, which ones of the 13, you know, seem to apply to you. I'm going to share with you mine. The first one of mine is inferior or flawed dragons. The second is responsible dragons, and the third is grief and lost dragons. Let's look at inferior or flawed dragons, okay? Please hold. Here we go. The origin of the inferior or flawed dragons, he says, is that you felt less than others in ability, looks, money, achievement, or relationships. You felt inadequate or that you could not live up to your parents' expectations. You were bullied, cut down, or criticized by peers, family, or authority figures, or you frequently compared yourself to others in a negative way. Due to social media, these dragons are causing an epidemic rise of anxiety, depression, and suicide in young people. So for me, yeah, I can, I can, I, this feels right to me. I was bullied a lot in middle school to the point where I have blocked out most of it, but that was really hard time in my life that made me question a lot of things about myself. Um, my parents were, were loving and great and supportive, but I do feel like there were very high expectations put on me that I frequently achieved, but the times where I maybe didn't, I was definitely felt the weight of that, I think, more than they intended. Um, I think we can really apply this to body image. You know, I've talked so much about body image. And in fact, he says the triggers for this dragon is when you compare yourself to others or compete against others and when you look in the mirror. So <laughs> I'm a very competitive person. I've been in sports my whole life. 
I look in the mirror and I see flaws. I, I feel inferior. And so that all makes sense to me. Um, the reactions to this type of dragon is that you drive feelings of inferiority, depression, helplessness, and jealousy, make you overly sensitive or a perfectionist, yeah, may lead to imposter syndrome, yeah, or body dysmorphic disorder when you only see flaws in your body. Yeah, yeah, all that makes sense. The movies he says that these dragons love are superhero movies, especially ones with Marvel, X-Men, mutant characters who have special powers. I mean, I don't know about all that, but I'm going to skip the part where he shares his personal anecdote as part of the in, this dragon. Um, but what's really important here, right, are the tools to tame this dragon. The first one is, do you recognize inferior or flawed dragons in your life? Do you have a tendency to compare yourself to others or find yourself envious? Do you feel less than others? Bunch of questions. Okay, so he says then, find the upside. If you were perfect, you'd be God. And clearly, you're not. Accepting your flaws will help you accept others because we all have flaws. This can help you be more humble and compassionate. Okay, so the thing with this, right, this black and white approach is that when you look at the other dragons that apply to me, they, they tend to directly conflict with that. Whereas I am an extremely empathetic and compassionate person. And so it's confusing, right? Okay, so let's keep going. <laughs> the strategies. Work hard to stop comparing yourself to others and be the best you can be. You can do this by number one, being aware when you do it. Number two, Knowing what triggers you to compare yourself to others and avoiding them. Example, social media, magazine, TV, etc. Three, changing your focus to something else. <sighs> Four, focusing on your strengths and accomplishments. At Five, praising others because it makes it more likely you will praise yourself. And number six, avoid mindlessly scrolling through social media. And he goes on to explain why. Okay. Easy peasy, right? And there's there's more there. Um, you know, it says stop caring what other people think of you because they are mostly not thinking about you at all. Realize that seeking perfection is a reason to fail, et cetera, et cetera. Here are some affirmations to say to yourself every day. Okay, so I mean, if we consider this dragon and connect it to my body image, which we all know some of the history of by now, let's take the first thing he says. One, be aware of when you're doing it. That one move when it comes to body image has taken me months, almost a year, right? And you know what? If I read this a year ago, I don't think I would have known how unaware I was. I would have told you I was pretty aware, but I didn't know what I didn't know. I think, you know, a lot of what he says in this book holds water. I'm not, you know, I'm not a doctor or anything, and it's not my place to really, to even like have this opinion, right? But after you've listened to enough interviews, you've read enough self-development books, and now for me, I've interviewed enough therapists and coaches to know that everyone is, is essentially saying the same thing, just packaged differently. And so he's doing that. He's saying the big self-development things. He's just packaging them a certain way. And to be clear, packaging matters. Packaging is going to speak differently. Packaging is going to speak to each person differently. Thank you. So it is critical that self-help is packaged in an endless amount of ways because different people need it said different ways and we're all different. But my point is that he's saying the same thing as many others. He's just leaving out a lot, right? Like, state number one, being aware of when you do it. Okay, how? How do we become aware? You know? And I could take each one of these and go, how? Know what triggers you to compare yourself to others and avoiding them. How? You know, I, I've talked to enough coaches now that actually have, you know, a, like a whole other paragraph or if not more that could go under each one of these bullet points. And we need to be saying constantly, you know, one might take you a year, right? I don't know. All right, let me move on to my other one, my responsible dragon. 
is this like fun for you guys or is this boring? If this is boring, just let me know and I'll never do it again. If it's fun and cool, just, you know, let me know. Okay. So responsible dragons, you feel liable for the pain or situation of others, often because you felt powerless to help someone you cared about, such as a parent or sibling who was suffering. This became rampant during the onset of the pandemic when hospitals would not allow family members to visit sick or dying loved ones, or you felt insignificant and fixing other people's issues, issues helped you feel significant. Children believe they are at the center of the universe, so if something good happens, they think it's because of them, but if something bad happens to someone they love, they often think it is because of them and feel responsible even though this thinking is irrational. The eldest child in a family often feels a natural sense of responsibility toward younger, younger siblings, and neglectful parents sometimes task older children with taking care of younger kids, even though they are not emotionally equipped to handle the responsibility. During the early months of the coronavirus pandemic, due to school closures, many tweens and teens had to assume resp adult responsibilities, yada, 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 yada. Okay. See, I feel like I need, uh, this one speaks more to me because of motherhood, which he talks nothing about. Um, I don't really relate to much of this, to be honest. I think as far as my childhood goes, I didn't have neglectful parents. I am essentially an only child. I have siblings, but I didn't grow up in the same house as them. I think that there was some dynamics there between, you know, my half siblings, my parents, and things that... I definitely didn't understand as a child and I didn't, I probably processed them in a way that felt helpless. So that, that tracks, right? Um, but I do relate to a lot of the rest of this. So the trigger is when you perceive others in need. Cool. And the reaction is, he says, this fixer, caretaker, codependent dragon can cause you to do too much for others. So they become dependent on you, which ultimately breeds entitlement and resentment and creates unbalanced relationships and long-term stress. So again, if we think about this from the standpoint of me feeling this because I'm a parent, not really sure it applies. Um, but I do know that when I know someone is in need, I tend to overdo it. I tend to, at least in my own mind, want to do too much. And I'll just share, you know, when... <laughs> A few years ago, my sister-in-law suddenly passed. My husband had to have a conversation with me where he said, listen, I appreciate how much you are there for, you know, my brother and for my niece and nephew. And I appreciate how much you want to do. He's like, but I need you to not burn out because you're maybe going overboard. You have a one-year-old. They know yeah, you're here for them. And, and, and it's that sort of thing. Like, I have a conversation with someone on the show about a particular community in need. And next thing you know, I'm signed up to volunteer and donate goods. Like I just hear about someone in need and I kind of like go all in. Um, I also respond to social happenings like very deeply and very emotionally. Um, when I say social happenings, I mean, you know, societal things like, George Floyd, I'm, I'm thinking of, um, you know, some of the school shootings, unfortunately, like, I will cry. Like, when Twitch died, I was upset. Like, I feel these things very deeply. Anyway, let's move on to ta how we tame the responsible dragon. Realize that doing too much for others can create dependency and inhibit them from being independent and self-sufficient. Self -sufficient. That's a strategy. That's the tool. The next tool is self-care is not selfish. Oh. Evaluate the people in your life. Do what you can to eliminate the contaminant people and increase the non-contaminants. <laughs> and here's some affirmations. I mean, like, you know what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying. Okay. Let's just quickly do grief and loss because... We'll just finish it out. Um, this one's actually pretty long, which I appreciated. And I think, you know, I didn't have, I didn't suffer a great loss as a child, but I know that the passing of my sister-in-law a few years ago really rocked me. I think it was the, the first time I really experienced loss that truly felt tragic. And I haven't talked about it so much on the show just because, mainly because there's an aspect of it that is mine to share, but there's a there's a great aspect of it that's not. Um, and it's 
I think, you know, some of the things he says, like shock, sadness, numbness, denial, despair, guilt, loneliness, helplessness, yearning, anxiety, da 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 like, yeah, all that, all that tracks. Um, and I think about her just about every day. Um, you know, I, I will say, to his credit, some of the healing uh, and taming tools here, some of the better ones, um, I, I actually won't get into because I think it will take too much time. But he basically says, here's some how to tame the grief and lost dragons, is um, one of the suggestions is to consider supplements, fix your sleep. Remember that crying is normal. Um, get any chest pain checked out. Be patient. Um, I think some of them are great. I'm only listing the ones that I I think are like, what? Like, of course. Like, what do you mean? How do I fix sleep? How do I, you know, what are you talking about? Why do I need supplements, you know? Um, anyway, 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 why am I doing all this with you? Why am I doing all this with you? Because, because, hold on, hold on, I should, I, I should do Dr. Amen some, I'm kind of doing him dirty right now, and I don't entirely mean to. Um, I do want to just say as it relates to this book, you know, he, that was just section one. There is a whole rest of this book, right? He talks about quiet, the they, them, and other dragons, meaning how to deal with like your parents, your siblings, your children, bullies, former lovers, internet trolls. Um, then he talks about the specific thoughts that develop from these dragons and, and how to work with those. Um, he talks about how to eliminate bad habits um, and some other some other things. I, I will say as like a warning, if you are interested in reading this book, this is not... Um, <laughs> to me, there does feel like there's some fat phobia here. Um, there are some food triggers and things that feel problematic. I don't know that I could have read this a year ago and not had a meltdown afterwards based on how he talks about food and healing our body through food and all of that, which I don't disagree with, but it's just the tone and the language used that are a little rough to process for me. Um, at this point, I should say they're not rough. I can read them for what they are and move past them, but a year ago, it would have been like, yeah, I would have read it as as my inferior and flawed dragon would have read it. Um, so anyway, anyway. All right. I'm just looking through here to make sure I didn't miss anything that I wanted to say about this. But all of this is that kind of a continuation of my last solo episode, episode 122, where... I say that self-development is about, isn't about finding one strategy. It's about taking a little bit of something from one person and a little bit of something from another person and so on and so on. And in reading this book, it's like, I know that an author wants to sell books, right? But I want there to be a disclaimer on the outside cover that says, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You will have to do much work to achieve what's written here. And actually, what's written here might not be exactly what works for you. <laughs> now, that wouldn't probably sell many books, but it's important. And it's important because I believe that knowing this, knowing that it's not a one-size-fits-all, is truly what keeps us motivated to keep learning and growing. And you know, I'm the same. I want the quick fix. But it's the promise of this one book will change everything that hurts us. We know this one book won't fix it all. And when it doesn't, after you get to the end of it, it's that feeling of defeat that depletes us of our drive to want to do more, to learn more, and to better ourselves. And so I thought it was interesting um, to go through this for that point. Um, you know, to remind us that we can take what we read in here with a grain of salt and to always ask ourselves throughout, but how? Okay, thanks for all these suggestions, Dr. Amen, but how do I do them? And if you don't know how to answer those but how questions, find yourself a therapist. 
or find another book to read or another podcast episode to listen to and just keep going. And anyway, that's the main message. I also just thought it would be interesting for you to get to know a little bit more about me and and know what my dragons are and why and all that. So keep going. This is the year. It all clicks. That's my new mantra. Everything is clicking. It's all clicking. This is the year it clicks. The how is not my concern. And my only job is to believe that everything is clicking, that everything works out for me, and that I do my best every day. Okay? All right. So if you're interested in the book, I will link it. I'm not, I haven't really sold you on it. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm the person that believes even the... I believe that anything you read, you can take something from. Um, I took from this a couple of reminders and strategies based on my dragons. Um, I also took from it that what I'm doing here matters, right? Because a book like this isn't how we're all going to help ourselves entirely, right? I A book like this creates a conversation on this show, which maybe prompts you to read his book or maybe prompts you to go figure out what your dragons are and then talk to your therapist about them. And, you know, it's the chain reaction. So, okay, I'm done rambling. I appreciate you. If you thought this was interesting and cool, let me know. If you thought it was boring as all get out, also let me know. <laughs> I won't do it to you again. And I'll catch you next time. Okay, bye.